Uh, so, yeah. good morning, Charles. Good morning. We are very pleased that you have agreed to this interview. Yes. And we would like to trace your interest in Tibetan studies. Sure. And we would like to begin with your childhood, with your growing right. up, with right. your family background. Right. Could you tell us something about your parents, their education, siblings, yes. the place where you grew up? Yes. Um, I was born in uh, Venezuela, uh, Maracaibo, uh, because my father was an engineer, um, uh, oil engineer, and 1950s was the time of oil engineering, um, in Venezuela anyway. Um, my mother is uh, Dutch, the uh, father worked for Shell, Shell Oil, and so I spent the first um, eight years of my life uh, in, mostly in Venezuela, sometime in America as well because of Houston and oil. And uh, then when was the company sends the children to school in the UK, boarding school. So um, that was my uh, education all start. Although I, I first uh, went to school in Venezuela and a little bit in Houston, Texas too. And how do you remember Venezuela as a child? <laughs> Hot. <laughs> yes, this is lovely for a child because you spend all the time in the swimming pool, basically, or on the beach. Yeah, and none of this rain. And <laughs> so you must know Spanish well. Uh, I did, fairly well, a little bit anyway. Yeah, um, but it's gone. I think. Yeah, it's perhaps somewhere in the back of my mind. But, uh, it, uh, if you don't use it after the age of eight, didn't use it. So um, that's probably gone. Did yeah. you have any siblings? Yes, uh, five. So I was the eldest of five, yes. So, uh, five of them born in Venezuela. And I uh, know two, myself, sister, one sister born in uh, America, in Houston. And um, then uh, another two born in Venezuela. And then one um, brother right at the end, born in Holland when my parents returned to Europe. So your parents returned to Holland? Yes, you, yes, because of Shell, yes. Mm. Yeah, until uh, my father's retirement, and then he moved back to England, yeah. So I used to go for holiday, my holiday periods um, were in Holland, basically, yeah. And you went to a boarding school? In yes, Europe. yes. And which one? Uh, it was called uh, Branks and Hilders, yes. Uh, it was, that was a prep school. Um, a fairly dreadful place, I thought. Um, but uh, and then I was afterwards. Uh, I went to Haleybury College, which has imperial. It was a sort of imperial. Uh, well, it used to be um, sort of training ground for imperial people, um, British, going to India and South Africa and places like that. Um, which again, I thought wasn't uh, a terribly good experience. My education wasn't a great experience at all. Um, yeah, it's uh, unpleasant. And it was in London, this place? No, uh, the, uh, one was in Surrey, uh, Branks and Hilders, and Haleybury College. Um, it used to be called Haleybury and Imperial Service College uh, until it, you know, it changed the name. And that was in Hertfordshire, north of London. Yeah. So. And uh, so how old were you when you finished this school? Uh, 18 or so, yeah. Yeah, and then I got a scholarship to, um, sort of exchange scholarship to uh, USA. Um, it's a sort of, in your gap year, it's the sort of thing you could do. And um, I went to a school in Hartford, Connecticut, rather than Hartford, England, um, Loomis School for two terms there. And then uh, from there, got entry to um, uh, Columbia University. Yeah. Oh, I see. So you... So you studied your bachelor at Columbia? I started, yes. I did a year there. It was a time of, um, well, excitement, shall we say, <laughs> revolution, uh, one would, some people would say. Um, but it was just unrest. It was Vietnam and uh, the bombing of Cambodia and the, you know, the college um, closed down. And it wasn't, I had a scholarship, but it still wasn't cheap. Um, and so, uh, and then in the, after the first year in the summer, um, I got arrested in Canada and um, I was deported back to the UK 
So um, that stopped my university education at the time. Um, and then I retrained as a, um, a woodcarver, actually. Yeah. So when you were studying at Columbia, was there a sense of student activism at that time? If yes, very much so, yes. Uh, a lot of the time there were no classes. And there was occupation of buildings, that sort of thing. Um, it was quite uh, hot-headed, I should say. Well, there were, you know, people, students were getting shot at Kent State University. Um, it was quite shocking. Um, and, yeah, the relationships with the police weren't good. New York was a pretty bad place then. Um, there were rapes in daylight uh, of students. Um, uh, you had to be ex escorted. The art school was four blocks away. Um, you had to be escort escorted there and that sort of thing. Um, it, was, it wasn't pleasant. You couldn't go to Harlem at all as a white person. Um, it was just... Uh, I did once by mistake, really, got out the wrong tube stop and uh, um, nothing actually happened, but there was a lot of antagonism, quite, you know, understandably. But uh, it wasn't a good situation, really. Um, but I quite enjoyed Columbia, yeah. Made some good friends there, I still see them, yeah. Were there some influential teachers on you or friends? Uh, no teachers, really. It was undergraduate, and um, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. You know, it was sort of, you did a... Um, I had an interest in uh, medieval studies, uh, basically, um, but uh, didn't really get a chance. You had to do all these required courses. Um, I was quite coming from a, a British um, school, which it was still quite uh, regimented and so forth. You know, your hair couldn't touch your ears, and that. it changed within a year or two after me leaving. I went back, and it was completely. You know, people were in jeans and that stuff, but we were still um, that old school sort of situation, which it was unpleasant to be on that borderline, really, because you wanted things to change and they hadn't changed yet. But anyway, um, I get, you arrive in Columbia in September or something, and uh, sitting on the lawn in the square, um, and there's a course on Bob Dylan, you know, who was still quite young, me himself, uh, and that was quite um, exciting, really. Yeah. What was the study program you involved? It was just in undergraduate, yeah. But yeah. what was it called officially? I can't remember really. Uh, what did you focus on within the course? Uh, well, we had to do a variety. Of, I had to do uh, European 17th century music or something. You know, you had to do a variety of things, a bit of art as well. I had an interest in sculpture, um, so I did. I went to the art school uh, for one course. And uh, literature, um, I don't really remember. There's a record of it somewhere, but it wasn't... Um, it was just, you know, being a student, really. It was quite exciting times. That was more impressive than, than, than the study. Yes. So it was probably a general course on the humanities? Yes, it was a humanities. What you liked? Yeah, yeah. yeah well, within, you, had to, uh, you know, had to do a bit of music, uh, history of music, perhaps. Oh, I had to do astronomy, for goodness sake. You know, had to do a science subject, so I chose astronomy. Um, and because I knew nothing about it, so it seemed interesting. Um, and I think the art was, I don't know how I wangled that, but I had an interest in that. So. Um, it, it sounds very vague, but that's how it was in those days. You sort of threw a pebble into the water and you know, waited for the ripples to come back. You know. What did you like the most? What did I like the most? The astronomy was quite good. <laughs> yes. um, but I didn't... No, I, I liked the ambiance, really. It was, that was the thing. It seems hard to believe now, but it was just being young um, in a very exciting time. Um, it was quite stressful as well, you know. To say, people were getting shot. Um, but um, it was... Uh, yeah, it was, that was the main emphasis wasn't particularly interested in um, studying in depth. <laughs> uh, did you get personally involved in the students? Not movement? much, no. no. Um, I did join the Black Panthers, <laughs> which kind of freaked them out. But they allowed me in, yes, so that was okay. Yeah, I was the only white guy in Black Panthers. Yeah. And can I ask if... 
uh, your arrestment afterwards mm. was somehow related? Oh no, this was a girlfriend, a Canadian girlfriend who was um, arrested for shoplifting and being stupid and 19. I thought by um, uh, sort of standing by her, so to speak, um, that would help. But actually it means that you're an accomplice. <laughs> See, my understanding of law was rubbish. Um, and uh, so she got a fine. And of course, this was, um, not of course, but this was one month after Charles Manson got arrested in, Can in, <laughs> in California. And I was in Vancouver. And uh, so it wasn't a good time to be called Charles Manson. It was all over the papers. Yeah. Uh, so they, uh, the, not Vancouver, Va Victoria and Victoria Island, which is more conservative than uh, um, Vancouver. So um, they put me in jail for a bit and I hadn't got a clue and there was no lawyer and I just got de uh, deported back to London. So I arrived back with absolutely nothing um, in London. And uh, would just, I was sleeping in parks and stuff for a while. And uh, eventually got it together to um, apply for a, a course in wood carving. I th I'd seen the um, totem poles in Vancouver Victoria as well, and uh, but mostly in Vancouver, and was very inspired by them. Uh, it's the kind of thing at 19 happens, and then next thing you know, you're carving. So I did two-year course in wood carving. In Canada. No, in London. Oh, yeah. sorry, in London. Yeah, yeah. It was um, quite a rarity then because a lot of these uh, sort of craft courses were dying out at the time. Um, and unbeknown to me, well, I soon found out that my two cousins, who were more or less the same age as me, were also in London learning how to make guitars, and they became really quite well known. Manson Guitars is quite a well known brand. Um, well, and I was um, doing this wood carving, yeah. And they were still, uh, they were still repairing work from um, the bombing of London. This was. Um, so what was this? Early 70s, so it was almost 30 years ago, but um, they called Hitler the patron saint of woodcarvers because he had bombed so many churches, or, um, and they were now uh, beginning to uh, repair or restore. The last, it was the last end of that. A lot of it had been done. And the Houses of Parliament, um, there was work to do there. St Paul's, Westminster Abbey, I did that sort of work. Yeah, so, yeah. Can we still see your work? Yes, yes, it's unsigned, but <laughs> it's there, yes. Come with you. <laughs> yes, yes. There's some on the um, House of Lords. I did a lotus. By then I'd become interested in Buddhism. And so I did a lotus uh, on the House of Lords, which it should really be, you know, a Tudor rose or something, but I, I thought um, I'd just sneak in a Buddhist symbol. <laughs> so was it your design or your um, acostumization of a certain design? Yes, yes. There's a ceiling bosses. Uh, they it's where the beams meet, and then you've got an opportunity. If they're really quite nice. They can be anyway. You look up in any old church, and some old buildings. Um, and if the carvers are given a free hand, they can just do what they like um, within reason, of course. But um, uh, sometimes it's quite uh, you know it's determined by the architect or the designer. But in this case, we were given a free hand, so. Um, there's a lotus in the House of Lords. <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> I just hope it doesn't fall down. <laughs> yeah. But why did you become interested in wood carving? Well, it was in Vancouver, yes, seeing the totem poles there. When I was back for IATS 2010, it was, um, it was quite a nice experience to go and see them again. I actually saw, oh gosh, I can't remember his name. There was a father and son, sort of famous totem pole carvers. Um, and I saw them actually, one, the sun anyway, um, doing, um, doing it, you know, outside on the lawn sort of thing. Um, but I didn't get, I didn't study it much, I just uh, thought that was something to do. And then I went back and sort of trained in the, um, the European tradition. You know, we learnt, you know, really the old techniques. I was working with some of the old carvers um, and it was sort of the end of a generation really. Uh, that was going on there, because uh, people, well, the 70s wasn't a good time in the UK financially, and um, although people had an interest in antiques and so forth, they uh, didn't have the money really to afford to redo buildings. There was a certain amount, but 
it was beginning to end all that period really. And you made your living at a time? Yeah, yeah I got a job um, locally at uh, EJ Bradford in um, it was actually the workshop was an old uh, Dickens Dickensian um, prison part of the Marshalsea area uh, Bermondsey and uh, it certainly smelled like it too but uh, yeah it was a firm that did uh, really at south of the river and they sort of catered for the city firms with coats of arms and you know those sort of griffin type dragon things you see in the city of London yeah we used to do all those I still see them up and um, I didn't actually work on those but they was done in plastic but um, the wood carving stuff uh, we used to do and, and the uh, delivery companies in London um, inside their boardrooms and stuff they have lettering names up uh, we used to do those too so it, it was good work yeah um, how old were you uh, this was 20 to 24 25 something like that yeah how yeah. many years uh, I did it in the end for I don't know 15 years or so yeah until economically it wasn't so good yeah so do you still wood carve now I don't no no I can always fall back in it. And they're going to redo the House of Parliament. They might need a, a bit of advice. <laughs> I don't know. I should write to the Speaker and uh, say, yeah. Uh, to preserve the lotus there. <laughs> yes. Uh, that'll be all right, yeah, I think. Yeah. I don't know. The, the new stuff should be all right. They, but, but they may want to... Um, we had to copy... Uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of frieze work. Uh, oak and ribbon. Mm-hmm. It was quite... In, uh, and then egg and dart and uh, stuff that you needed to um, uh, do in the same style. Uh, did the House of Lords um, dining room. They were extending it. There's so many of them. You know, they needed a bigger dining room. Uh, and it had to be in the same style. So we had to carve it all. Yeah. So. so were there particular topics or images you liked to carve? Yes, yes. I got uh, from that company uh, I don't know whether I got board or something. Anyway, I decided to go to Germany. I went to Oberammergau, which is famous for wood carving. Um, it's where they have the uh, religious ceremony every 10 years. And in the meantime, economically, they survive on wood carving. And so I went there and um, said, you know, what about it? Uh, could I have a job? And they said yes. And so that worked uh, not for very long, though, because um, uh, there was... Oh yes, there was a bit of, uh, the oil crisis happened in Europe and there was a kind of shrinkage. And of course, being a foreigner, you're the last one in, you're the first one out, so to speak. And uh, so I, yeah, I had to leave then. And also I, um, I discovered that um, I'd fathered a child uh, back in England. So I came back to uh, uh, sort that out and look after um, that situation, yeah. But I, I carved uh, figures there, uh, sort of Madonna and Child, and uh, I remember St. Anthony was a nice one, yeah, but uh, it was more figurines there, not so much architectural carving, but uh, figure carving. In Germany? Yes. And is it, is it still there? In well, this was, no, this wasn't churches so much, this was um, a lot of, especially in the South, Bavaria, um, you know, the living room, they have some carving, religious carving on the walls. Um, and of course, this is great for woodcarvers. Uh, and they had what I did learn there was the machinery they used, uh, which we didn't know of in the UK. Uh, I did find out eventually there was one machine run by a Polish guy, which, uh, and there was another one in Northern Ireland run by an Italian. Um, but um, we did everything by hand, basically. So that's how they made it economic. So that was sort of my idea when I came back to uh, um, set myself up independently. Um, using these machines to, because you do about two thirds of the work it gets done by machine, and then you finish it off by hand. So it looks hand done, but of course all the heavy work of you know chipping away gets done by machine. So that was that. <laughs> Did you like certain kinds of wood? To wood. Work with? Yes, lime is lovely. Uh, we did a lot of oak for the uh, for Parliament and churches. It's sort of natural um, material for that, but. Um, for figures, more lime, it's uh, linden. Uh, and that's very close grain, very soft, uh, can be, um, if you get a good piece. Uh, and uh, 
Yeah, that was really the nicest work. Um, I did some in cherry, that was quite nice, in bits. Um, I found some uh, billiard table legs, those big fat billiard table legs in Cuban mahogany, which I then adapted, they, you know, the same shape as figures. Um, so I did work on that at some one time, and that was quite nice, Cuban mahogany, it's a beautiful wood. Um, but an awful lot, once it started getting more commercial and working on the machines, I worked on uh, what's called genutong. It's um, a jungle wood, um, and jungle woods grow straight and uh, narrow, really. Um, and the grain is quite close, uh, so it's it's uninteresting to work with. But the um, it was quite similar to um, lime, and it's used by pattern makers when they're making patterns for um, casting into metal and so forth. It keeps a good edge. That's the point about lime. Um, oak doesn't keep quite as good an edge. Uh, so when you're getting detail on, you know, figures, fingers and faces and so forth, um, uh, you know, a good edge is uh, is very important, a sharp edge. And um, this jelly tong, although it's a little bit boring, if it's getting covered in, in uh, gold, it doesn't really matter. But it's, uh, it's very fast to work as well, it's quite soft. Um, I think the sap they use for chewing gum, I'm not sure, but that was the the legend, but I never really did research it. So. so when you were carving this lotus, mm. you were probably already interested in Asia or in yes. Buddhism? Yes, I took a, a, while I was still a student, I did two years at uh, stu studying before I went to work um, locally in Bermondsey. And um, I, yeah, I was, as a student, you know, a house in Clapham, four pounds a week rent, that sort of thing. Those were the days, and uh, they, um, somebody just, uh, yes, I was interested in meditation. Uh, it had been a little bit unnerving being, you know, deported. I was a bit disorientated in some ways, and I was sort of looking for something, I suppose. And uh, I was interested in meditation, so I sort of went to a couple, you know, there, every now and again these Indian teachers would come to the UK and that sort of thing. Uh, but none of them really particularly interested me. And then this um, guitarist handed me a, um, a book, Meditation in Action by Trumper, his first book. Trumper at this time was probably still in Samuelin. He'd left Oxford. Um, gone up to Samuel Ling in, what, 67 or so. This was around about 70, 71, 70, 70 maybe. And uh, I read it and I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, so I went off, um, as you do as a student in your holiday, uh, I think I went to the first Glastonbury or something, and um, then kept on going to Wales, up through Ireland. The troubles were happening in Northern Ireland. I was wandering around on the border area there. Not really. I did get stopped by some farmers with guns, yes. But um, they, they took me as being innocent, fortunately. And um, then made, from there, went across to Stranraer, to Scotland, to where I understood Trumper was. Um, and, but he'd, he'd just left. <laughs> he'd gone to Vermont. Well, he'd gone to Canada and then down to Vermont where I had just been, because I'd been hitchhiking in Vermont, and some hippie types had picked me up, and I'd stayed there a few days. And I later found out that this was actually Barnet, Vermont, was where he set up his... So there was a sort of complete mismatch there going on. Um, so anyway, and I met um, uh, Akong there, and uh, he sort of fairly shortly found out that I was a woodcarver. I was only there for a week or two and said, oh, will you come and work here? <laughs> I said, yeah, it seems a nice place. So I went back to carry on studying and then came back in the summer and then would go back and forth a bit, um, sort of wood carving and stuff um, there. But um, then that sort of was the first connection with um, Tibetans, really. Um, Why were you interested in meditation? <laughs> Well, I think it was a disorientation of, of being deported, really. There was a sort of, um, uh, I don't know, unease there, uh, perhaps, and I was sort of, I don't know, I'd had, um, I'd had been 
as a, I was uh, confirmed as a Church of England, and I had been interested in that. Um, I used to go to the services um, beyond. I, I found the you know the regular school services very boring, but the communion I used to go to when you didn't need to, you know, I'd get up early and go to that. So there was some kind of bhakchak going on there, um, and uh, yeah, the, the sort of perhaps that itch, you know, and I, but I wasn't interested so much in the Christianity, really. Um, uh, I don't know why. If I'd met somebody who could explain it better to me, perhaps I might have done, but uh, I sort of stumbled into this um, Tibetan uh, Buddhism world, which then was quite, um, in, you know, there was only meditation in action, um, the Book of the Dead, which couldn't really make head or tail of, you know, it was just very strange. Yeah. Um, so that was the beginning, really. And it was more the thing of having this farm in Scotland that you could go and stay in, and there were kind of like-minded people there a little bit. And, uh, it was uh, free and easy, yeah. But you must have read books or you must have known something mm. about Buddhist meditation to get to it. Not really, no. I, I was just looking at meditation seemed the thing, you know, that was the buzzword. Beatles and all that, you know. And so you start, uh, uh, I can't remember, Guruji or somebody turns up, 16-year-old Indian, and um, you go and see them um, and either you're impressed or you're not, uh, so I didn't follow it up. But there was some kind of, uh, a little bit of searching, not, you know, assiduous, not reading a lot, uh, and then somebody just lands a book on you and that speaks to you. Um, and, uh, you know, he then says, oh, I was up, you know, at Samuel Ng. He was more from, he wasn't necessarily the, all that interested in himself, but he was a musician, um, you know, coming down from Edinburgh or something like that and stopped off at Samuel Ng. And that sort of sparked my interest, really. And how do you remember Samuel Ng at the time? <laughs> Yeah, it's very chaotic, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It was, uh, yeah. We didn't really understand what was going on, you know. It was, uh, I remember um, uh, Kalu Rinpoche uh, came. It was, I think it was his, yeah, it was his first visit to the West. And he came with um, a bit of an entourage. I can't remember how many now. But uh, we sort of, a couple of us, you know, went to see Akong and said, um, so what do we do when we meet this Tibetan Lama? Because Akong just lived, you know, he was married by then. May have already had a child, I think. Um, and uh, he seemed quite, you know, wore Western clothes. And, um, and there was a monk there, Samton. Um, and there was Sherab, the artist. Uh, I think that was all that was, all that was um, there at the time. And uh, Kalu turns up and uh, offers to give people refuge, and we hadn't got a clue what refuge was at all. But it seemed like a good idea to do, you know. So you just did it, yeah. And we didn't know, you know, do we bow, do we... Whatever, what do you do to a religious teacher from the East? Uh, just no idea, none of us really. One or two had been to India, and so they knew everything, you know. They, <laughs> but they hadn't met that many Tibetans really. Um, it was mostly, they'd been sort of traveling around India. Um, so it was, uh, it was a bit of an odd situation now. Um, you look back at it, nobody knew Tibetan at all. Nobody was terribly interested in it, really. Um, they didn't do any pujas. They used to just sit in the uh, pujas that... Um, the, uh, I don't remember doing any pujas anyway. And they used to do chenrezi, I think. The, the monk did. I can't remember anybody doing much, really. Um, but that's me. Maybe there was stuff going on. I just wasn't that interested at the time. Yeah. Did you develop some friendships there? And uh, were yeah. other to become scholars of Tibetan studies at the time? There was a group of people. Not there, no. Not scholars types, yeah. Um, I did actually, um, just as a you know, slight anecdote, when I was back, you know, 
studying and working as a woodcarver in London, I did karate in the evenings. And it so turns out that the same karate teacher, um, Charles Ramble, uh, uh, went to <laughs> a couple of years later, I think. <laughs> so we have the same guru <laughs> in karate. Yeah. We're not going to fight, by the way. <laughs> it's a bit past that time. Yeah. But uh, yes, uh, George, his name was. <laughs> yes. uh, but I don't remember anybody. Uh, I can't remember any. Scholar. I mean, Ken Holmes was there, Katia Holmes. Um, but none of the um, sort of academic um, roots scholars. Uh, I can't remember any of them. Uh, I may well be wrong, but I, um, there was mostly uh, there wasn't even much accent on practice. Quite frankly, yeah. it was sort of um, a kind of you know communal living type vegetarian type thing going on. Yes, um, back to the earth, you know. And so you're friends there? Uh, yes, 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 over the years. I had a, um, so when, uh, 1974, uh, my son was born. So I kind of was tied in with that and I economically had to make that work. Um, so uh, we mostly, I, I would just visit uh, really at, um, from time to time, either for their courses or yeah, it was mostly the courses by then, yes, sort of make an effort and, and go up there. And how old were you at this time? 24, 23, yeah. yeah. And a baby, really. <laughs> <laughs> so did you also work as a woodcarver? Yes, yeah, I was doing, that was my financial uh, support, yes. But yeah. in some as well? Um, well, you couldn't work there in that sense, yeah, uh, yeah. but uh, yes, I did do um, some work. Uh, and I think... I don't think he'd really, Akong um, had really developed the idea of building a temple there yet, but maybe he did, I don't know. Um, the instigation for that was when the Kamapa first visited in uh, 1974. Um, that was, what, December, November, December 1974, I think, yeah. I think the Dalai Lama had first visited uh, in 73, maybe. Um, and because I was doing karate, um, <laughs> Our karate club was asked to be the bodyguards for the Dalai Lama. <laughs> so I was a, body, a so-called bodyguard for the Dalai Lama. Basically what it was, was you had to hang around in the passageways and spot anybody who was um, a near do well sort of thing. Um, it wasn't a close-up bodyguard. Uh, and this got repeated about 20 years later, but uh, not for the karate reasons, but for different reasons. Yeah. So I've twice been a Dalai Lama bodyguard. So how was it? <laughs> how was it being a bodyguard? <laughs> it was great. You just stood in the corridor, you know, watching out for um, somebody who might not want to. Do I had no idea, you know. It, it was just uh, I don't know. It was that's what they called you, but uh, it didn't really mean much. Yeah. How do you remember the visit of His Holiness at that Which time? one? Um, the Dalai Lama. Was Dalai Lama. The first one? Yeah, so yeah. Time? Yeah, he came to London. Um, where was it? I think it was Friend's House. Yeah, I'm fairly sure it was there. And um, somebody said, Oh, I remember Richardson being in the front row there. Uh, that was quite interesting. Uh, although I didn't know him then. I mean, I didn't really know him anyway, ever, but um, I didn't know of him. Uh, but I remember somebody saying, oh, that's the British, um, you know, who was in uh, uh, Lhasa. And um, I do remember somebody asking him, so he'd been in America, and uh, somebody said, you know, how, how did you find America? And Dalai Lama was, you know, I mean, it's like somebody from a different planet for a lot of people at that time. Um, he'd been in a, mentioned in a Prokhal Haram, a sort of <laughs> long song about the Dalai Lama, um, which was my only sort of connection with, uh, really, that was all, you know, I just knew this name. But somehow you hear about this and then you turn up and it just happens. That's the way things were for me, a sort of fluid. And um, somebody asked him, so how did you find America? And he said, oh, it's very poor. And this was quite shocking, but what he'd, he'd been driving around Washington, I think, and, you know, famously, 
you drive two blocks away from the main mall and you see the poverty there, especially in the 1970s. Um, and so everybody's sort of, oh, really? You know, we hadn't really, because a lot of us, a lot of travel to America wasn't really happening yet for, it was for some people, but most people um, not. Uh, and so they got this image, the Hollywood TV image of, of, of America. So that was quite, um, that was something that stuck in my mind, yeah. So. Some other impressions? Other impressions <laughs> of Dalai Lama? Yeah. No, um, not really. No, I didn't, I wasn't terribly involved. Uh, I was only involved in the sense that my karate club was asked to be the bodyguard. <laughs> but that was about it. I wasn't, you know, it was kind of interesting, and uh, but it wasn't terribly, um, that's, you know, just me at 24, 23, yeah, so um, not that interested. And the really? community around? Community around? Mm, that came to this visit. I don't know. I really didn't know them much. Um, I didn't know what was going on. You know, uh, it was just something to do. You know, with the um, those the monks who chant came. Um, Juto, I think it was. They came to a church in Smith Square, in uh, in a church in central London, and it sounded. You know, there's a nice poster. It's free. You go. You know, well, almost free. Mm -hmm. But I had no idea what was going on, and you know, it was uh, maybe it's hard to uh, realize now. But there wasn't um, that. Uh, I did start going to um, my uh, well partner um, was um, her father was Burmese. He was an emigrant from uh, uh, Burma in the nineteen twenties or thirties, I think, and. So she had a, um, a sort of interest in uh, Buddhism as well, but not Tibetan Buddhism at all. So we used to go to um, the, the Buddhist Society. Christmas Humphreys was um, still around then. Um, I had the... <laughs> I met him, shall we say, yes. <laughs> but uh, uh, that was sort of the extent of... Um, yeah, we used to go to a sort of evening class in meditation then, but not terribly interested in anything more than just sitting, really. Um, not studying or anything like that. Not reading much. Mm. And one year later, were you a bodyguard of the Karmapa as well? Uh, no, no. Um, maybe they didn't need them, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, uh, it was just I went uh, because I was by now, as a family man, um, we moved to uh, Essex, uh, courtesy of Ken Livingstone. He was in charge of the GLC, and they had a program where um, if you could apply for, um, it seems impossible nowadays, but uh, for a mortgage and uh, on the council, so to speak. And so the mortgage was um, £30 a month, I think. Yeah. It was heavily subsidised. The idea was to move people out of slum areas. In, um, uh, I was living in Vauxhall um, in um, London, which was at the time a slum. And um, the uh, so that was in Essex, and so that was close to um, 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 uh, Marpa House. It just started. I was there for the opening of Marpa House. I think Prince of Sikkim was opened it. I'm not sure. Um, but again, you see, it's vague because I wasn't terribly interested, really. I just sort of, there was a sort of interest, but only because, oh, that's going on, let's go and do that, you know. It's like entertainment, really, yeah. <laughs> and, um, how do you remember Agon Rinpoche at that time? Uh, how? Yeah. Well, he was quite young. I, I now realise he was quite, I mean, he was, he was actually ten years older than me, um, more or less, well, he didn't know his birthday. Until he declared it was Christmas Day, <laughs> uh, that was a bit of a joke, I think. Um, but yes, he was ten years older, so um, he must have been when I first met him thirty. But he seemed—I uh, don't know if you remember when you were twenty, somebody who was twenty-five or thirty seemed terribly wise and, <laughs> and old, knowledgeable. Um, now that you know, ten years means very little, really. But. Um, 
so that's, you know, he seemed quite um, quiet. Uh, he didn't, you know, do much or say an awful lot. And he used to see people um, for the interviews and they would sort of, I don't know what they did, but it was a bit like going to see a doctor or something. And they would ask for advice and um, stuff like that. Um, but I don't think he gave much in terms of practice at all. It was more just sort of practical advice um, if people were upset about things and that sort of thing. It was sort of ther th uh, therapy more than um, uh, religious or spiritual advice you know, or anything to do with you know, how to do a practice or um, that sort of thing. Did you meet any other Tibetan or Indian teachers at a time? Well, there was Kalu uh, Rinche. Um, hmm. At that time, well, the Kamapa came in '74. Yeah, that was quite um, powerful sort of meeting. That, I think that's what sort of struck me, really, um, seeing the Black Hat uh, ceremony, uh, receiving in initiation, and then I um, somewhere around about '73, '74. Um, I realized that taking refuge with the Kala Rinpoche, um, I hadn't understood a thing. So I went to Akong and said, look, I think I'd like to take refuge properly and with some understanding. And he said, okay, you do a three-day, you know, I'll give you refuge sort of thing. And you do a three-day retreat. Oh, it was torture. Three days of, I mean, you know, subsequent days, you'll find out uh, it became three days is nothing. But um, at the time, to actually stop in a room for three days and just medi try to meditate. Uh, it was absolute torture. I didn't enjoy it at all. Um, but that was sort of 73, I think, yeah. Maybe, yeah, possibly 73. I think it was before Alistair was born, yeah. Um, and before I'd gone to Germany, yeah. Around back then, anyway. And uh, so I then started to do Nundro, um, you know, there was so there must have been something was starting then, you know, in that sort of 73, 70, but probably after Kala Rinpoche came. I, I think that's when it um, it started because he probably talked about people doing Nundro and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, so I started doing the prostrations, and they took forever. You know, I just a working person. It was um, um, it was quite difficult, and with a child too. The time was quite uh, taken up, so I started doing that, yeah. and then uh, come up came and uh, you know took uh, an initiation or two, um, and uh, saw him in um, London, in Marpa House in Birmingham, and in uh, Samuel too, quite a few times. Yeah. So you were a very serious practitioner. I was beginning to be. Yes, yes, yes. It was kind of. Um, yeah, I suppose that was, yes, that had started to happen, yeah. yeah. Why was it important for you? Why? Hmm, mm, I really couldn't tell you. <laughs> it just seemed a good thing to do, you know. It wasn't, uh, uh, there was some, I suppose there was some degree of promise that you would be a better person, that sort of thing, you know, by doing meditation and, and uh, um, I wasn't mentally I wasn't I didn't have many troubles you know um, I was quite well adjusted I, I would think <laughs> I don't know if my friends and girlfriends might say different but <laughs> um, it seemed like that yeah so uh, yeah it was it was sort of like a hobby really in a way it became more serious later, but then, yeah, um, I, I continued, I mean, just to go through the 70s, um, I was, you know, a family person, and then my wife discovered um, she had cancer, and so we went into that scenario, and it took three years for her to die, so um, that was quite um, traumatic, really. Um, and then it became more serious, and I think there was a sort of impetus there, when you meet death, sort of face to face. Um, it's quite, uh, at that age as well, um, I think that really changed quite a bit, yeah. So the visit of the Karmapa was very influential? Yes, it was, yes, I would say so. But not towards studying so much, as more towards um, 
uh, practice, and then you know discovering that there were all these practices that they were you know initiations and all that. Um, it seemed quite weird and magical, really. Um, and I sort of went along with it in, in a, f- a reasonably serious way, actually. Perhaps I'm trivialising my um, my attitude, but um, yeah, it, it was quite gradual. I, I wouldn't want to say, you know, it was um, sort of jumping into something. Yeah. What was so interesting or so appealing about Kamapa? Kamapa, uh, uh, charisma. Yeah, definitely charisma. Um, yeah, it was just, uh, you, I mean, you just felt it, yeah. It was quite extraordinary. Um, and uh, um, the crown, the black crown ceremony, that was quite uh, quite something, yeah. And uh, he, uh, he was very pleasant, um, uh, Maggie, my partner, um, about the, the cancer was beginning to uh, develop and so it was breast cancer uh, he was very nice about that um, so yeah it was kind of um, yeah I mean I, I sort of I wasn't troubled within myself but there was there were troubles happening and so there was a certain degree of uh, looking for some kind of support perhaps or something extra to the medical side uh, um, it was difficult in those days. There was no cancer um, uh, therapy, uh, you know, talking therapy and all that. There was one person in the whole of London. I was in Essex and, you know, you would have had to go. I mean, it was just awful. And the way they treated uh, women, the male doctors, just appalling, actually. Um, we were really unfortunate. Um, and things changed very quickly, you know. Hospices hadn't started yet. They were just beginning, maybe I'm wrong, but they're just beginning to start. Yes, I remember seeing, the, you know, the one. Um, but all of that, um, you know, what's a spare rib was going on, all that, you know, f- feminization, feminist uh, stuff. It was really beginning then. Um, although, well, it, it had started earlier, but it was getting more mainstream, I suppose. Um, so we struggled quite a bit with the hospital system. Uh, and... Yeah, it was a difficult time. And if we are if we are in the seventies, yeah. By any chance, did you come across the first IELTS conference in Oxford no. in seventy nine? No, no interest at all. I didn't even know it existed. No. No. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I yeah, should have. That's fine. <laughs> I don't mean to disrespect. <laughs> yeah. At about the same time, you decided mm. to go for a Tibetan refuge or Buddhist refuge. Yes, yes, in the early seventies. Yes, seventy-three, I think it was. Yeah. But you also maybe seventy-two. Yeah. Then did a retreat. A short a three-day retreat. Yes, with torture. Yeah, but afterwards, <laughs> yeah. was there another retreat? Um, well, they did sort of group retreats. Akong mm. did uh, a couple of fairly. They became sort of quite well known. Um, sort of, I think Trungpa was doing much the same sort of thing in America, and it would be um, three or four weeks of, of um, quite structured, uh, and he would talk and give exercises uh, for people to do and that, um, um, meditation exercises. Um, and yeah, so I attended um, a couple of those. Yeah, uh, I made sure. I mean, it was quite, it wasn't that easy. With family situation, but um, uh, yeah, I was I was that interested, that committed, so we say, to 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 make sure that I did that. So, um, how were the the eighties for you? <laughs> I missed them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I died in uh, nineteen eighty. Uh, Akong uh, took a pilgrimage party, thirty people, I think. And by then, uh, the writing was really, you know, she hadn't got long to live, and I don't know. Anyway, it sort of got um, quite difficult, uh, sort of into family stuff. And, uh, so my idea was that um, I was trying to get some kind of blessing or something to, you know, some external help for the situation. Not so much to cure, but uh, just for a good death, basically. 
So um, I went on this pilgrimage, even though there was a young child, and she was close to... Um, I went in December and she died in May. Um, so it, that caused a lot of problem, you can imagine, but yeah, for good or ill, uh, that's what I did. And um, so then I got to, you know, did the um, mm, pilgrimage thing we did. Uh, it was good, it was a very good experience. And we ended up at Rumtek for Losa, I think. And for some reason, the Kamapa said, uh, well, he got to find out that I was um, a carver or something. And he said, uh, oh, can you do some casting of statues there? Which meant, at the time, room tech, you couldn't stay longer than a week. Um, well, you could, but it involved... Um, the China border wasn't that far away. And um, so they, he, you know, arranged it that... Um, I got to stay and I cast um, several statues there. Um, and there was a, um, let me think, I th- there was a Buddha belonging to Shama. These were like treasure statues. Um, a Kamapakshi belonging to uh, Gyalsa Rumache, um, which was a, um, supposedly made in his image. Um, I mean, it was supposed to look exactly like him. And uh, Vajrasattva belonging to Jamkan Control. Um, and I think there was another one. Um, it was quite difficult. Um, I, yes, I think I'd brought... Yes, Akon had known about this. Well, he hadn't known... I can't remember the details now. But he'd asked me to bring some rubber for the casting. So I was traipsing around India with um, cans of rubber um, and, but I needed plaster to make the case and getting plaster in Gangtok wasn't that easy and I needed clay and fortunately the Bhutanese royal family I couldn't get clay, the monks weren't interested you know, who's this Inji wanting clay um, and uh, so I went to see the um, was she the royal grandmother, I think, in Bhutan. She had a bungalow opposite um, Rumtek, and uh, I went and said, you know, I was trying to get some clay, and she just clicked her fingers and said, go, you know, take him to the... So, you know, servants, so to speak, um, helped me get clay, and I had to process it and, and got plaster from uh, Gantok and then used the rubber and made these um, statues. And I think I did a bit of a retreat there at the time. Yes, I did. Um, partly making the statues, um, because I would get all these people looking at me, doing, I couldn't do the work, you know. So it, it helped <laughs> uh, being separate in a room. And also I, I just wanted to do that as well. Um, so I did that and then finished. And um, in the meantime, Katia had also been asked to stay there, Katia Holmes, um, and she worked on that... Um, uh, Zalandara book, uh, Zakachupa. Um, uh, with um, the Kempo there. And I, yeah, this was, um, I spoke to Shankan Kontral, the one who died. And uh, <laughs> I don't know how it happened, really. But I said, oh, I was, you know, I thought I would take... Um, some vows, the um, Getzel vows. I didn't want to change dress or anything, but I wanted to take the Getzel vows. And I think somewhere it got misunderstood. <laughs> and I suppose I can't have been in that great a state of mind, really, with the wife dying and all that. So um, he said, oh, yes, yes, you get ordained, you know. And so I went back, late, you know, as a monk, right? I went back and said, look, uh, you know, I can't do this. It's, uh, uh, I've got a, you know, well, a partner and a child. And um, as far as I understand, you need to have your parents' permission to become a Buddhist monk. I didn't know much, but uh, I thought I knew that. And uh, I said, no, 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 that's fine. You know, you make a good monk and all this. So I sort of stumbled into that, really, in a way. I mean, I was committed, but you look back now at the... um, 
person and uh, you think, hmm, not, not a great decision really. But um, I mean, a good decision to be a monk, nobody can, you know. But in those circumstances, not a, a particularly good decision perhaps. Anyway, I did it and um, so I, I, I got ordained um, and uh, I couldn't, you know, you couldn't phone your parents and say, look, I'm doing this. I had to send telegrams. <laughs> you know, they sent a telegram saying something like, um, do what you think's best, you know. Um, I don't think it uh, was particularly good for them. But um, so I came back um, as a monk and of course this caused uh, family eruptions. Um, and when was that? It must have been about April in 74. No, sorry, it's, uh, not uh, 80, 1980. And uh, she died in May uh, 1980. So um, then I went up to uh, Samueling and um, started living there, really, as a monk and wood carving, yeah. Earning a, my keep as a... Um, they it wouldn't allow me to... Uh, at that time, Akon would not allow um, monks to not pay. Um, that changed when uh, his brother came. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you couldn't go on the dole or anything like that. Yeah. So, that's what I did. <laughs> Do we still see your statues at the room deck? Um, well, I made copies and brought them back to saint -Malin. I, I think there was a bit of a misunderstanding going on there, but um, I don't know what he wanted, uh, Kamapa. But in the end, I, I just thought he wanted this cast, and I take them back, and then they made fiberglass copies, and they were made for some years. Um, I don't know what's happened now to them. The casts don't last that long. The rubber doesn't last that long. Um, so I'm, I do think. <laughs> I suspect that the, um, uh, when was I in Kathmandu last, in 2010, and there were a lot of Marpa statues around, and I'm fairly sure, being sold in the shops, and I'm fairly sure that there are, somebody had got hold of one of the Kamapakshi ones, had taken the hat off and doctored it to be a Marpa statue. But I couldn't swear to it. It looked <laughs> exactly the same. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, I didn't get a chance to uh, look at it more closely. But, um, yeah, so they, um, you know, they sold them in the shop at Sammy Lane, basically. Yeah. And what were your impressions of coming uh, into a Tibetan community when you came to Sikkim? Um, it, it was your first encounter. Yeah, yeah it was, yes. Um, I think I had done... Yes, because when the Kamapa came in 79, I think, he came again, mm -hmm. around about then. Was it 79, 78, 79, something like that? Yeah. Um, there was this course. They, he brought a Kempo with him, Kempo Sultan Janso. And they uh, announced this course in London that they were going to learn the language. And uh, I decided to attend because it was in France and I could take my partner and child. Uh, we went there for six months and that's where I learnt um, Tibetan first. Um, you know, the alphabet and we worked on the Dapo Tajin as a, you know, as a text to work through um, and the Gyu Lama as well. Um, and we just spent six months all day doing this. Um, my partner, she worked, uh, she worked, uh, did some of the cooking uh, to help pay the way. And uh, that was a a pretty serious um, commitment to learning the Tibetan language then. Um, so then when I came to India, uh, you know, the next year in the pilgrimage, I could speak a little bit, you know, broken pidgin uh, Tibetan. And, um, uh, yeah, I felt uh, fairly, you know, I found it easy to meet people. And, um, the monastic community in particular I felt fairly easy with, I think. Um, I don't know why, but that's, it, it seemed to uh, uh, be an easy thing to do, yeah. What were your impressions of India and Sikkim? Um, hot. <laughs> I, see, I, I knew, uh, I got, I hardly got ill at all, you know, as a party of Europeans, their first experience of the heat and um, 
the lack of hygiene. Um, they got, all of them got it, but I probably had built up some degree of immunity being a child in Venezuela. Um, so that wasn't so bad for me in a way. Um, and I'd seen, as a child, I'd seen um, you know, people without limbs and disease and that sort of serious disease which you don't see in Europe anymore. Um, so it wasn't quite perhaps as shocking um, as it was to some, perhaps. Um, I just, I didn't like the hassling, you know, that sort of bargaining business. You know. But then that's, <laughs> it's just annoying. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it was fine. Yeah, I quite enjoyed it. Were there other foreigners around at the room tech at the time? At room tech, no, I think we were pretty much the only part. Oh, I did meet um, Tenzin Palmo. She came. Well, the, the um, Simon Ling party had left, and she came. We sort of met, we, joke, we used to joke about it, we meet every 10 years in the oddest places. Um, uh, and I see she's, I think she's in the UK this year. So. Uh, but she was, I think she'd just been ordained then. I'm not sure. Um, but she was quite helpful, actually. I uh, talked to her um, as a woman. I was, you know, this whole disturbance with um, wife being ill. And uh, uh, she was actually quite... Um, she was a bit... <laughs> I think she's calmed down a lot now. Uh, but uh, at the time, she was uh, very, a little bit intense. <laughs> She hadn't done her long retreat uh, yet, then. So the first Tibetan language you learned was probably classical Tibetan yes. Indian Buddhist text? Yes, yes, in, um, in France. Yeah. 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 And then you used it as a spoken language? Yeah, a little bit, Italian yes, yeah. yeah. I've never been uh, terribly good at uh, spoken. It's not, uh, yeah, I don't think quick enough. <laughs> And then you returned back as a monk to Samyaling. Yes. You continued your practice. Yes, yes, yes. Um, it was a bit unusual. People found it a little bit strange, perhaps, that he was a monk working for money. <laughs> but uh, that was, uh, you know, I had to. Uh, so um, that's what I did. Um, and they were beginning, of course, because the Kamapa had come and he'd said, build a monast build a temple here. They were beginning, uh, and I took a lot of the pictures that they used as a basis for um, the design of uh, Samuel Ling Temple, actually. Um, I was going around measuring a lot of the time, um, making pictures that, they, you know, it was black and white uh, in those days, a really old camera. And um, then we used uh, those uh, for the uh, Samuel Ling design. Um, it, well, as a bit of inspiration, you know, Tashi Jong, uh, room tech, um, that sort of thing. Uh, pictures from there. Um, they, they must. Uh, I don't have them anymore. I gave them to Akon. Uh, they must still be there. And um, yeah, that was it, I think. And then the following year, the Kamapa died in um, America, and I saw uh, Akon <coughs> couldn't go, or didn't want to go or something. Anyway, he couldn't go. And so um, he asked me to go as a sort of, not a representative, but, you know, somebody from Samuel and take pictures there as well. So I did take uh, quite a lot of uh, pictures. I talked to um, German Control Sitter and Chair about it. Um, I was there when um, the material came out of the um, funeral pyre. I think a heart and a tongue. The Sitter and Chair was... Uh, Received it. Yeah, um, it was. Uh, yeah, it was quite a odd situation. But that was a bit of a shorter trip. Uh, just there for that. Took the photographs, and um, they were filming. Um, uh, you see, it's since become a friend, Elliot, um, for Trumpers people. They took a, made a film of it, I think, um, and uh, then just came back to uh, Samuel. Yeah. And the, the photographs, I, I hope they, they haven't been lost, yeah, because it, it's a record of, uh, of that, but um, they may have got lost. <laughs> yeah, I gave them to Akko, yeah. How long did you stay in Samueling? 
when you um, Well, the wife died in May, so and then um, they decided to um, uh, start this retreat business. Um, three, three, four years. They decided on four years. It's, I mean, and um, so I signed up for that, uh, and it meant preparation. Uh, three or four years of preparation. Um, you needed to be able to read Tibetan. Um, and uh, Lama Ganga was appointed the um, retreat master. He was one of Trungpa um, uh main lamas. He'd done num- you know retreats at um, Trungpa Monastery, and um, it wasn't the first retreat in Europe, but it was the first in the UK anyway. And there was seven males, I think, and I can't remember how many females, 12 maybe. I can't, oh. um, can't remember the numbers. Um, and uh, so we prepared for that and started in 74 and did four years there. And then came out for a year. They expanded. A lot more people wanted to do it. Expanded the buildings and uh, went back into the second retreat as well. Did another four years there. Sort of helping people a little bit with um, understanding the Tibetan. Less people could read Tibetan and they sort of didn't exactly drop it but um, there were people who and there there was a lot of frustration in the second retreat building up about not understanding stuff. So I um, would translate the instructions a little bit or something like that um, and uh, then um, had it typed out. I thought uh, it was a distraction from being in retreat but I thought you can't have this uh, going on where people don't know what they're doing really. They're just reciting and, you know, the lights going here and there, the meditation and all that. Um, it was quite difficult and it seemed, I don't know, my perception was that it created sort of frustration going on. And then, I think it was Chakrasambhara. It may have been Vajrayogini. Peter Roberts was doing, um, he would translate the um, uh, commentaries. He did some really good work there. I mean, you know, fast, of course, and uh, but, you know, worked really hard. And uh, But there were some sort of instructions that um, uh, I would either translate or make notes of and write down. And um, it was quite. Ex- the, we yeah, we printed them out, and you know sent it down from the retreat, and it got printed. And the next day, it was like whoosh, <laughs> energy gone. You know that frustration of not knowing what was going on. I I thought anyway. It seemed to calm things down a little bit. Retreats can be quite uh, group retreat, quite intense. Really, um, a lot of stuff comes out. So it was a group retreat. Yes. People were together. Yeah, we had no idea. Yeah, you go in, you think, oh, I'm going to meditate for. You know, I can remember thinking, oh, nice window. I can meditate and look out the window for four years. No, <laughs> there's an awful lot of um, really quite hard work goes on, and it's as much hard work with other people um, because everybody's going through shit, you know, um, and it's all coming out. So. That's part of, uh, it's, you know, if any, well, certainly for some of the time, that's the most important thing that's going on, really. Uh, later, you know, people kind of accommodate and they do more sort of internal, well, it's all internal, I suppose, but more profound work, but um, it's just <laughs> accommodating other people's uh, stuff. It's, uh, it is quite intense. And you did it twice? Yeah, said. yeah. So twice for three years? Four years. Four yeah. years yeah. in a group retreat. Yeah. yeah. And the other group was males as well? The second group? Uh, yeah, 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 it had to be. You can't have males and females to mm. retreat. Well, you can, I suppose, but yeah, it creates problems. So, so yeah. you spent the 80s. Yeah, that's, I missed them. Yeah. <laughs> Gulf War, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Thatcher, who's she? <laughs> yes. yes, it was quite a good time to <laughs> avoid the world, yes. Yeah, missed. Uh, uh, we got a garbled thing once. Um, this must have been 90, I suppose, um, because the Tibetan uh, Lama Yeshe came in. Uh, uh, because Lama Ganga died uh, in between the two retreats. Yeah. 
and uh, Omiyashi came in and he said, oh, there's been a change of Prime Minister. And he said, uh, um, he, he sort of presented it like there was some kind of coup, really. You know, it was a bit of a coup, you know, Thatcher getting thrown out. Uh, she got thrown out and um, there's this major. And of course, we thought they meant an army major. <laughs> we had no idea. <laughs> You've been three years by then, two, three years in retreat. <laughs> But there's nothing you could do, you know. <laughs> so you did get letters from, you know, then you find out. Uh, but uh, uh, once a month you, you're able to write. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's quite funny. He just, he just said, I don't know, he's, he's major something, you know. That, of course that sends off all these uh, fantasies that you can easily develop in a, in a retreat, yeah. How was the retreat organized? So How? Did yeah. you stayed in one room? Or yeah, one uh, room? well we did, uh, you know, pujas, morning, prostrations were done more or less together, um, uh, but otherwise you'd have sessions, you know, it was a regular kaju um, retreat. Uh, they tried to follow, you know, they took it from Trangu Monastery, uh, follow the program. What extended it was that they did, um, Akron requested that we did uh, Kunshu Chido for a longer time than usual. I'm not even sure that that was in a regular program, Kunshu Chido. And the Amitabha practice as well, he wanted people to do for longer than uh, usual towards the end. And that sort of made it up uh, here and there. You know, we had to ex- extend it. Um, uh, the chirp was quite long, I think. But I think that was a normal period of time. But they sort of extended bits. Uh, in order to, there's an extra nine months yeah, that we completed. Yeah. There was a master with you. Yeah, Lama Ganga. He wasn't there all the time, which was a bit of a shock for people, I think. But uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, because he would, he also would then go off to California or wherever, and you know, teach there. He was, uh, um, I think, Kamapa had asked him to be in uh, California, to, and it, or, or KTD in, in New York. And all of you did the same practice, or was it Yeah, that was the idea. Um, <laughs> but that was, you know, you've got West, headstrong Westerners, uh, people towards... I mean, I think there's, they started off at the beginning like that quite a lot, but um, it became a bit funny towards the end. People sort of started making up their own stuff, really. Or, or their own sort of program. In the first retreat. The second retreat, um, Lama Yeshi came in, and he was a bit more uh, open to people doing you know, what suited them, really. Um, if they couldn't do this, or, then they would sort of work out something a little bit different. Um, and then the idea of, um, you know, being able to read Tibetan was sort of gone, really. Um, people just read the phonetics. You know. What was your feeling after completing the retreat, or the two retreats? Ah, I thought it was very worthwhile, yeah, mm. really worthwhile. Um, yeah, it was uh, good. Okay, it was pretty hellish at times, but um, that's kind of the point, really. Um, it was it was a good experience. Yeah. And then the nineties. <laughs> yes, yes. So this is ninety three, I think I came out. Yeah. So mm-hmm. eighty four to ninety three, with a one year in between, and no longer a monk, um, and. Uh, let me see. Lama Yeshi was sort of, Akong was more and more going to Tibet, spending quite a lot of time there. He'd started Rokpa and all that. And, um, and it was easier to go to China and stuff. And he, um, Kamapa had been found, well, one of them had been found and uh, inaugurated in uh, Sopu. And Lama Yeshi had been there. And he'd met this Kama Rinpoche, a Tertan there, and uh, who's fairly charismatic and unusual. Um, he's now dead, but um, and who was discovering, you know, now Thomas, uh, so to speak. And uh, I think they'd hit it off a bit at Serpu, and so he came back, and then. Uh, this uh, Kama Rinpoche, this 
Tachen Karma is known as, um, had got a, a sort of one pass permit to leave China and go to Dharamsala and so forth. So Pema, Kathmandu, and then you would have to return. Um, and he said to Lama Yeshe, why don't you come and I'll give you instruction in Chulen. Um, and Lama Yeshe said, oh, I don't like Chulen. <laughs> it means not eating. <laughs> Uh, and he hadn't got the time, he had responsibilities, and so he said, you go, me. Um, so I quickly got some sponsorship together. I'd only recently come out of retreat, actually, so I hadn't really started any much money or anything. Um, I was a bit spaced out as well, you know, after two retreats. Um, and uh, so I went to India um, with Annie Tsering, um, Elizabeth uh, Philippe. Um, French Laotian uh, lady, and um, uh, because you know, male and female should go. And so we met up with um, Tetch and Karma in um, where did we meet? Sopema, yeah. And it was a good, you know, and said, you know, actually, I think we first met in Delhi, yeah, and then went up to Sopema. Anyway, that's, um, that's where he was doing a Chulen uh, uh, sort of retreat there in the caves up there. And um, so we kind of, you know, uh, participated. And there were a couple of other, there was Australian, there was a Russian, um, I think two Americans there as well. And I kind of did a little bit, I think the Russian did most of the translating at the time. Um, and he would give instruction uh, to the Tibetans, basically, with a few in, um, in the caves up there. And then um, we'd do this uh, Chulen. We did the um, uh, Rubu uh, Chulen first, uh, the pill. And uh, it was fairly... And then we'd have stories and stuff, and he'd show us the termas, and, uh, you know, the, the text of the termas, anyway. And he'd been taking them round to the Dalai Lama, to Sitarumche, and they would... Sort of a little bit, you know, well, it might be a term and it might, you know, it's quite um, a little bit, uh, I mean, how do you certify a term? But uh, uh, he would get their stamps on the text and he was very proud of this. You know? And he was liable to burst into song. He was very effusive, you know. Uh, you'd be in a restaurant and he would just sing in, you know, this good, this sort of old style, you imagine, medieval almost. Uh, and that was quite uh, fun, really. Um, <clears throat> and one time he... Um, what happened? Oh yeah, he was walking, uh, sort of evening walk with a couple of people. And he said, there's a terma in that rock over there. It was a boulder. It was about this size. Um, if you know Tsopama, it's sort of like that, a rocky up there. And... Um, he, uh, he said, there's a terma in there. And so he decided to go into retreat for a week. And he would do the um, retreat um, space uh, chulen, namka chulen, which meant no eating and I think no water as well. Um, and yeah, because water chulen is, yeah. And um, so he would, uh, he decided to do that. And so he had one, did he have an attendant? I don't think he even had an attendant. I don't think anybody went in. He was on his own in the Guru Rinpoche cave there, which had a sort of hole going. There must have been some gap, so you could actually hear, this is relevant <laughs> later, uh, underneath uh, in the cave. Uh, you could hear him singing anyway, get rid of a And so uh, after about a week, um, it transpired that this rock. Um, he'd, uh, he'd asked, there was a big Tibetan who, they managed to lift this rock. And he did a retreat with this rock in Guru Rinpoche cave. It cracked open and inside was um, some uh, material, uh, written material and four objects, uh, round, white, half round, golden colour, um, try uh, Sorry, no, sorry. Round white, square golden colour, half round red, and uh, triangular black. 
the, the activities sort of thing. And this was inset into the rock. I mean, as a, you know, something of a carver. It was quite extraordinary. Um, there were pieces sort of inset. And then lying on top of them, so to speak, was again, you know, with a sort of inset gap, was this text inside a rock. Uh, don't ask me how or why. But, uh, um, and I'd actually been, um, you know, during this week retreat, I'd sort of wandered up there and been on top of the cave, uh, sort of listening, out, you know, listening to him uh, singing or whatever. I never heard any chisel <laughs> going, you know. Um, of course, maybe he was doing it at night, you know, if you're going to follow that line. But um, he then uh, told us, of course, he was very happy and singing a lot. Uh, and he told us a story that uh, there were a lot of obstacles. Somebody had got very um, uh, ill, somebody close to, I think, not a sister, but uh, like a main, main um, disciple, Annie, disciple, older, um, uh, had had a, like a big accident. And there was sort of all this kind of obstacle type stuff going on. And he said he had a dream and, uh, you know, a lady in, dressed in white came and said, you know, carry on. And don't. He, he got a bit desperate because things weren't happening. What he'd done is tied a cord around this um, uh, uh, rock, boulder, rock, I suppose. And it, it split that way, or the, the thing was tied that way. And um, then, you know, this happened. It just cracked open. And so uh, he broke his retreat and told everybody about it. Um, and uh, it was pretty amazing, really. Um, and he's sitting there in the cave on a camp bed, um, and it's sort of kind of rubble. Uh, you may have been there. And uh, one of those fold up Indian camp beds and singing away and stuff um, with the terma sort of on a the ledge there. He wouldn't allow us to see the paper. He said it had to be interpreted, you know. He said obstacles, uh, it could disappear again. Um, but we saw, you know, the holes in the rock. Uh, I took pictures of it, there are, you know, photographs. And um, uh, he had always told us that he'd left, he'd uh, made a footprint in a cave in Tibet with his, I think it was left leg, uh, you know, it could be the other way around. And he said, oh, this leg, it feels like making a footprint. <laughs> and he looked around, of course, seeing on the bed, and it's all rubble, you know, it's like, you know, dirt and, and little pebbles and stuff. And so he said, where, where can I do it? You know, he said it was coming from his heart, this energy. And uh, somebody, you know, his nephew or somebody said, look on the wall there. So he just leaned over for the bed, put his foot into the rock, and it went in about a centimetre. Um, I wasn't there at the time, um, but that, uh, this, you know, this was a story. Again, um, well, never heard any carving, and as a carver, I looked at it, and it wasn't carved. You know, you cannot achieve that in stone. Um, that detail was there. You could see, you know, the the walls on your big toe, that sort of skin thing, that was in the rock. So it, it was as though, you know, when you've got um, soft sand or and you step in it, and if it's very very fine sand, you can, you know, wet, you can get that impression. Um, you can do it with clay, perhaps. That's what it was, you know. It's a, I think it's still there. Well, it must be. It's a rock in the cave, but uh, um, I think they uh, they filled it in. Um, I, that's a story, and I haven't been back uh, there, uh, but somebody told me it's been filled in because there was trouble that um, he'd found this stuff, and the rumours started, and there was because one of the things was yellow, it was gold, therefore, and that he'd, you know, been a gold smuggler. You know how these things uh, escalate. And so they've um, decided, I think they decided to cover it in. Um, but it can probably, um, I don't know, uh, I haven't bothered to go back uh, uh, there. But um, that's what happened then. Which place is it exactly? At Topema, in the uh, Guru Ramcha cave. Yeah. In Sikkim? At the top. No, no, this is, at uh, Topema is uh, Rawalsa. Okay, yeah. I see. On the uh, yeah. west side, yes. yeah. Yeah, near beer and yeah, that whole strip, yeah, Telo, beer, yeah, and Sopama, uh, just north of yeah, Mandi. 
Yes, 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 yes. It's, a, it's quite developed now. It yes, was quite it small is, then. It's a tourist resort. Yeah. Well. <laughs> well, it wasn't then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was just uh, Tibetans, basically. Then, yeah. Few Indians, but no shops much. Yeah, or maybe one or two. But it, yeah, I've heard that it's changed quite a lot. Yeah. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, that's up there. <laughs> From when would that be? Ninety-three. I th- no. Yes, ninety-three. So anyway, uh, I'm now, you know, in a cottage somewhere in Scotland, uh, carving, and uh, having returned. And he said, uh, "Oh no, I got, you know, I, this perks my interest, you know, um, a, a terma, a new terma." And uh, I said, "Well, you know, can we look at it? Can we do something on it? What is it about?" He taught the um, uh, Rilbo Chulen and the Dort Chulen, yeah. I came back to the cottage and did both practices um, in retreat there, and also uh, uh, the the so-called Bardo retreat is dark retreat actually from Ujintoku, um, which was I did that in at the I think at that time, yeah, went to Kathmandu and um, did the retreat there, uh, not for terribly long. I did I think two weeks. Anyway, I uh, came back and uh, did these uh, Chulen retreats. And um, he said, come back next year uh, and I'll have it interpreted. So, um, so I go back the next year, uh, find his monastery in the middle of nowhere, um, over the border in Tibet, in, uh, uh, near Jomda there. Um, I mean, you had to ride horses to get there, sort of thing. Um, and illegal. Um, I actually got arrested twice. Um, not imprisoned or it, but stopped, you know and then uh, told to leave um, twice. Uh, it was a bit stupid, really, but... In Eastern Himalayas? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. In, uh, no, no, this is in Tibet. Oh, uh, Jomda. I went to Dergi, okay. um, Hong Kong, Chengdu, you know, the usual route, up to Dergi, and, and then from Dergi went over the border. Uh, I had um, a jeep. You mean the border of... The TAR? TAR, so yeah, yeah. Team. You couldn't so get, I couldn't get a permit. Yeah. Uh, at Ganzi, they, um, uh, the secret police people, or mm. yeah, police anyway, uh, plainclothes police, um, told me to leave. Uh, there'd been a certain amount of trouble. Um, but they never followed up on it, so I went to the bus stop, and there were buses going south, there were buses going north. So I waited to see if they were there, and I just carried on, which was very responsible. Um, but yeah, so I went on uh, and then hired a jeep um, in um, Dege to go on to, uh, and would just be hiding. Uh, they were they were still blaring out from the radio um, the propaganda, you know, in the morning and the afternoon, and I wasn't supposed to be. I sort of wore a hat and uh, uh, tried to hide the white skin, sort of thing. Um, and I think a beard too. But um, yeah, it was very silly, really. I would never do that now. But um, so I went on. I had to hire, uh, the driver insisted I hire a guy with a rifle as well. Because they're bandits too. We did see them at one point. You know, he waved the rifle out to make sure they knew. Um, went on to Jomda and then up. And then they said, this is it. In the middle of nowhere. And they said, here's, you know, we'll get you a horse. And went off on a horse. A white horse for a white man, they said. <laughs> um, and found him, got to the monastery, the nunnery actually, uh, where he has a, a retreat place there. They were just coming out of a uh, three year retreat, I think. Or were they in retreat? I think the following year they came out, yeah. Um, so found him there and he said, Oh, sorry, fin- not finished. <laughs> I had to go all the way back. <laughs> Escorted back. Um, yeah, it was a bit... Um, anyway, it didn't seem to have caused much trouble, fortunately. Um, it was foolish, I could have got them into trouble. Yeah. But I kind of talked quite a bit um, to the um, authority, the Chinese authorities, showed them pictures of family and you know, trying to make it seem unthreatening. And uh, I came back and then came again uh, this time he was up in um, Yushu, the Nanza Kamata retreat, and he'd taken them up to Yushu. 
and uh, he'd gone to meet um, there's a toko called Mapa, I think. It's supposed to be an incarnation of Mapa or something. And he lived up in the hills uh, near Yushu, Jukundu. And um, they did this trance stuff, um, uh, Yeshi, uh, Yeshi Bab. Uh, and uh, it turns out, I didn't realize this, that Tetch and Karma did this as well, but this Mapa. Oh, I can't remember the rest of his name now. But um, And he inspired his... Uh, he'd been many years... He'd been... Both Tetch and Karma and him had stayed in Tibet, up in the hills, when the communists came. Uh, and then they'd come down again afterwards, when things relaxed. And he'd been doing this um, sort of uh, trance business. Uh, it's really quite scary when you see it the first time. Um, and I filmed... By this time, I had a camera, a film camera, a video, and filmed some of this um, happening... Um, and it's quite unusual. Um, and it seems to be to do with the... Um, there's some kind of um, writing of the internal energies going on, because there's a lot of sort of jerking. It depends on the person. Some people have their... their the uh, tsa are um, rather crooked or tied up or knotted. And that's what goes on in retreat as well with the, uh, the chudruk. Um, uh, the truko and so forth. It's you know getting those energy flows straightened out, which can be very very painful. I had a number of um, it seemed like heart attacks actually. I mean really really painful. But that was stuff getting sorted out um, in retreat. And these uh, some of these people seem to be doing this. Um, uh, quite a lot of uh, women actually, um, and some would be suffering a lot of pain. Um, it was really unpleasant for them. Um, physical, I mean, they would sort of be in trance but in pain at the same time. Uh, and then some it would be very sweet, and he did explain it, uh, Mapa. Um, he, um, he said that, uh, you know, depending on what state your tsa are in, um, for some it will be very painful, and then gradually they get straightened, and then it just becomes, maybe you cry a little bit, or um, you get quite blissful, and just, you know, sort of space out, I suppose. Um, that's what happened to him when this, there would be people trancing all around and he would just be very uh, calm and blissful sort of thing. He was very experienced in this. So it seemed to be a sort of practice, really. Um, they would do some um, singing, uh, uh, certainly when the, there was some kind of initiation, um, I didn't really get too involved um, in it. And... Um, I just sort of observed it, and I was behind a camera, and that kind of distances you quite a lot. Um, and uh, and sometimes they would just uh, spontaneously go into it, um, these trances. Um, I remember hearing at night, when I first um, arrived, you, you'd be way, way up on the hill. You had to go up there by horse and, you know, stuff. And... Uh, you know, the eagles were below you, sort of thing. And the um, I remember hearing this sort of weird. It sounded like something out of a horror movie going on. And so the next morning, I, you know, I found out who it was, and I said, "Oh," and I met him, and I said, "So, uh, it was you making all that noise last night. Um, what was going on?" You know. And he just, you know. And he just went off. He was completely normal otherwise. He just went off into a treat for, into um, uh, trance, yeah, for three hours. Yeah. Like, it's, I've got quite a lot of it on film. Um, and it's like a sort of um, Mark Aller type thing yeah, he was doing. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, and making those noises as well. <laughs> he tried to imagine what Mark Aller's noises. Uh, there was another who was um, who would sing a lot, a, a woman, uh, and she was beautiful singing, really beautiful, and she would be in some kind of trance going on. She was claimed to be quite an expert at this. You know, she was quite advanced. They sort of respected her. There was another who came up, uh, an old lady who brought the milk up every day from the. She put down the milk, sort of stood there. The other one was singing, and she just went into a trance. But for her, it was quite painful. You know, it was like doubling over with uh, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, uh, so anyway, at that time, around that all sort of happening, 
um, this terma I got hold of, <laughs> which he had then had his um, nephew copy out, and it had been expanded. Um, for instance, uh, Lotok Nampashi, the Four Ways of Changing the Mind, um, he had expanded into 200 pages. You see, it's like mentioned as two words, and it gets expanded like that, um, interpreted, I suppose. That's what a Tertan does, I presume. Uh, so and he gave me a copy, you know, with a blessing and all that, and said you can, uh, not exactly a lung, but, you know, a bonk on the head, and that served as the lung, he said. Um, so I came back, and by then um, I needed to get work, and uh, the wood carving had more or less gone in the 90s, it wasn't. Uh, and so I got work uh, working in television, um, subtitling, for captioning for the deaf, and... Uh, um, in my spare time, I would go to the British Library and transcribe this. It was in Ume, this um, uh, terma, uh, working on that. Um, and gradually, uh, you know, I never did complete that, um, but I still have it. Uh, and that's sort of half of it done. In, um, uh, I should make a copy so it's not lost or anything. It's the only one that's in the West, I suppose. He gave me two termers. Was a, uh, job. He had about 30 termers he'd discovered um, in his lifetime. And um, then I decided, uh, yeah, the captioning for BBC, ITV went on for 10 years or so. You, you know, you make quite a bit of money. And um, just working with words, really. It was quite similar to wood carving, actually, um, because people talk and you have to get it down. You have to, you know, what do you do with wood? You edit it, sort of thing. Um, so, although it seemed very different, it was actually not that different. And then I decided to go to, um, uh, there was a sort of redundancy type situation going on, and I elected to uh, take it and go back to college at SOAS, because my university had been messed up, what with all the uh, writing, it was writing at uh, Columbia and stuff, and then the jail and deportation, and... Um, it had been messed up, really, and I, I, I sort of, I thought, well, I'll give it a try, and I did, and I, I went to SOAS, and, and just loved it, and did the um, four years there, so. Why um, did you decide to study Why? academically? Well, I got fed up with uh, typing <laughs> for <laughs> BBC. <laughs> There's only so much you can do, you know. Uh, oh, no, it was good. We had a, what was nice is we had a nice lot of people doing it, and there was a camaraderie there. But it was beginning to disappear um, because it was getting more... The pressure was building up and Sky came in and, you know, the competition and all that. Uh, so it, the pleasure was going, really. Um, you know how you get a situation where there's a group of 10, 20 people and everything's great and then it, time passes and, uh, and it was time to leave. Quite a lot of us sort of went off and did other things. Yeah. So you did the BA... That's yeah, Tibetan and study religions. Yeah. yeah. And what was your thesis, your BA thesis, if you had to write? No, I didn't have to write one. No. And then you continued. I did a sort of translation of um, uh, Burkhardt Kessel of British Library one day. Uh, I was interested in Kamapakshi from the practice sort of point of view, and I've been looking at his uh, Mandon Sangpa's. Uh, um, life story of, of him uh, you know, in the setring and uh, uh, Burkhardt said oh he's done um, um, you know there's an autobiography thing and he lent me his copy I photocopied it and did a project in um, Kathmandu with a Kempo there of going through it was all in Ume quite difficult to read Ume and uh, got it all typed out and stuff and started working on it a little bit um, translated a certain amount at SOAS for um, maybe 10, 20 pages maybe 10, 15 pages and um, and that was sort of part of the independent study project, ISP <laughs> yes. see, memory hasn't gone completely and uh, then uh, um, Jake Dalton uh, was at British Library doing Dunhuang stuff, and he was he talked a bit in um, uh, Soas as well, uh, 
and I was there, you know, uh, was in one of his classes. Anyway, we got um, talking, and he said, um, by the way, if you do MA, um, Harvard Divinity School is quite a good place to go, uh, because uh, it's cheaper, and it's not that, well, I shouldn't say this, but it's not that difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a 50-50, you know, half the people get in. Uh, so that's what I did. Uh, and being British, they cut your fees in half, you know. You just have to show your passport. Uh, God knows why. Somebody in... Yeah. Um, so I went to Harvard for, and did the MA, the MTS, it was a Master of Theological Studies. And loved it, absolutely loved it, um, uh, with my partner there. And um, uh, discovered that my ancestors are buried in Harvard graveyard, and, that sort of thing. I have an ancestor who was um, governor of Massachusetts uh, in the royalist days, so <laughs> I kept it a little bit quiet. <laughs> no, I'm not keen on the royal family there. But um, uh, so yes, and uh, studied with um, um, uh, Leonard Van Kamp and Janet Jatsoy. So that was a great time. And then came back, enrolled in Oxford, and. Uh, uh, with Charles Ramble, and um, uh, then he left for France, and I got I needed work as well. I, I got into quite a bit of debt, um, and I don't like being in debt, and it's really difficult to get out of uh, if you're studying at the same time. And at my age, you can't sort of you know put these things off really. And um, so I uh, started getting jobs, you know, captioning for the theatre here again from the subtitling experience and doing the voice of the Oxford Dictionary <laughs> reading all these 40,000 sentences for the uh, example sentences for the Oxford Dictionary and um, uh, library of course Bodleian Library and uh, I've been here ever since um, looking one, it's only one day a week uh, um, could do with being more <laughs> but uh, uh, I did do two days a week for one year, and it, you get more than twice as much done um, like that. Uh, but anyway, it seems to work, and uh, I, I really much enjoy it. Um, I've done some work for the SOAS library, um, cataloguing. Uh, they 500 texts there that they didn't know what they were. Um, were. Nobody looked at them, really, from, I don't know, some from the 20s, the 30s, the 60s. Nobody looked at the stuff, really. Nothing terribly, terribly revelationary, but um, uh, still, it's all listed now. And then, um, just recently, I've been working as well with the British Library, too. Um, they've got a bit of a backlog there. There's printed works, not their manuscripts and texts, but um, um, helping there. And uh, we've had a couple of, uh, at Bodleian, um, the ARIS initial funding from Sadra has ended. Um, it lasted for about, f well, it lasted five years and then a bit more, maybe another two years, I think, one day a week, five years full time for Ralph um, Kramer. And, um, but they managed to, you know, Julian Everson manages to find money uh, every two years when the contract comes up. And I continue, um, and we've had um, John Driver's uh, collection has come in. I've just been working on it this morning. Do a little bit every week. Uh, loads and loads of mostly prayers and stuff, practices and prayers. Um, some about 130, 150 texts, larger texts, and about 400 smaller uh, prayers. Uh, some manuscripts, maybe five to ten percent of manuscripts. The rest are xylographs. Um, a couple of uh, really nice illuminated manuscripts. Um, uh, a Katandenga manuscript there. And there's still um, Richardson's material to um, do. One day a week, when you're trying to keep up with the regular stuff that's getting printed, you know, the oodles of stuff that's getting printed in China at the moment, and to a certain extent India, um, uh, it's quite difficult to actually catch up with, you know, the backlog of uh, Richardson's material and um, Aris's as well. There's at least 50, 70. Aris um, texts that um, haven't been catalogued or anything. Um, so, needs to be done. <laughs> Did you know Michael and Antonio? No, I didn't. Can you no. 
Yes, I was, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, I didn't know. Uh, yes, yes, uh, yes, I knew Anthony. Yes, yes, very nice to meet him. And um, uh, no, I didn't know Michael, no. Because no. I, I wasn't um, interested in academia until about 2003, really. It was more just interested in practice and then getting some kind of pension sorted out and, you know, living sorted out for 10 years of um, subtitling. Um, didn't get much involved with... Uh, I would go to occasional talks, you know, Trangu would give a talk or something, but um, uh, not much involved, really. Um, but then much more involved once I started going to SOAS again, yeah. I was a little bit surprised how much, how much it, you know, I'd missed doing something like that um, because it had been interrupted uh, 30, 40 years before. Yeah. 30 years before. <laughs> yeah. um, what do you like about working in libraries and working with Tibetan manuscripts? Because <laughs> you've done so much. Yeah, well, it's very civilized. <laughs> Uh, the people you work with, uh, that's always, you know, a major consideration, I think. Um, in the libraries, uh, really good, yeah. Very nice people, usually. Um, it's, uh, and, yeah, I do recall being, you know, back at, uh, doing A-levels and all that. Uh, we had a library there. Nobody used to use it. I was always in there, you know. Doing, I, I um, actually wrote. Um, there were all these prizes that came up every year, you know, the, for the fifteen-year-olds, and the, and you'd have to write something uh, quite apart from uh, your usual schoolwork. And it was all. I always did this. I, you know, I, I thought, oh, well, that's a way of getting books. You know, you, you'd have to buy get books as a prize. And I just found it interesting to do. You know, um, I mean, I was quite a. Um, wild teenager, but there was this other side that would just love sitting and, you know, reading books. You know, I did a paper on Disraeli or Gothic architecture, you know, it's like 70 pages when you're 17. It was quite unusual. Um, and uh, there was that sort of, so it's, it was almost like a, again, a backchuck there. Um, but then Thereafter, not being in libraries much at all, not doing all that much reading, quite frankly. Um, in retreat, you do a lot of reading, of course, of, of prayers and stuff. But um, yeah, so it was it was like a, a return to um, that kind of interest, um, just books and knowledge and so forth. And I, I like to make it available too. It's sort of um, the. Um, it's not so much, I'm not terribly well organized. Um, I think you are. <laughs> it's all relative. Uh, I give an impression of being organized. But uh, it's, yeah, but it's not, well, you ain't seen my study. <laughs> it's a complete disorganization, you know. But I sort of know where everything is, you know, it's that kind of organization. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, so it's, it's not that. Mentality of you know, uh, knowing, putting things in order, but it's more making stuff so that it uh, available for people to find out stuff. Um, really um, preserving it as well, um, I suppose, and uh, enhancing. I don't know. You know, it's a service basically. I suppose um, not to be too precious about it, but that's uh, yeah, that's what it has to be really. Yeah, we are very grateful. <laughs> I was just, yes, I was waiting for that. <laughs> you fell for it. <laughs> you also taught at SOAS. I don't know if yes. you are still teaching there. I just had an email this morning that they want a, uh, a one-year stopgap uh, thing. But I did three years there, yeah. yeah. I really enjoyed that too, actually. Again, a little bit surprised. Um, uh, again, it's, you know, it's passing on whatever knowledge you have, making it, you know, people, giving them skills, I suppose. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was quite good. I managed, what's quite um, useful is I kind of keep under the administrative radar. 
So you don't get involved in, this is my theory of <laughs> how to have a, a reasonably happy life. <laughs> you don't get involved in administration. Not that, you know, administration has to be done. I don't decry it. And it does wonderful things, it makes all this possible. But um, it's just not for me, sort of thing. And I, I prefer to just get on with life, um, uh, riding under that radar, you know, doing the, the work at the coalface, so to speak of catalog, you know, cataloging is not that interesting, but um, it can be, you can make it interesting for yourself, um, but um, not necessarily um, get involved in, in, in um, administration. It's, uh, it's a difficult thing. Some people are very good at it, and you know, good luck to them, but uh, I just, uh, no. <laughs> so I don't have ambitions to go up, you know, I, I sort of like to keep under the ceiling, you know. Just a few more things. Yes. Uh, mm, uh, it's quite obvious why you are interested in Karma Pakshi. Yes. <laughs> yes. But um, why does the topic of reincarnation attract you? Well, you can't avoid it with him, can you? <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, that's... Uh, 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 the initial thing was... Um, uh, I got a lot out of his practice uh, in retreat, and um, so then you start as a, you know, a bit of a diversion really, interested in his life, and then it becomes quite fascinating. And here's a crucial figure, which nobody's done much about really. Um, there's been a certain amount, you know, with Kampstein and so forth, but um, not an, not exhaustive, uh, and. Um, I just thought, you know, why not? Uh, but the trouble is that, you know, making a living at the same time, uh, because I came into it late, uh, and I missed out, you know, the PhD business where you, uh, you used to get, uh, if you want to do a PhD and you get accepted, things would get paid for. <laughs> I was just the last, when I applied, um, missed that. So, and, you know, I did numerous applications, numerous you just couldn't, and it's just it's just so difficult. Um, if you're younger, you can perhaps you know skim it a bit, but um, you know get by. But I don't know, I wasn't, um, and I had to get out of debt too. Uh, it took me two years to do that. Um, that was my feeling anyway. Uh, and so you keep on doing a little bit of a job, and it doesn't work with. I find uh, I found the long way uh, of, with PhD. It just doesn't work. Um, you need to have the time separate. Um, you need to be sponsored basically by state or grant or something. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that was that. But anyway, uh, I still carry on with work. Yeah, it's, um, I do papers and stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's quite... Um, uh, yeah, I enjoy it. And what do you think this work has given you for your life? <laughs> ah, not much money. <laughs> yeah, I'm fairly uh, okay with it. You know, it's fine. Um, intellectually. I, oh, intellectually. I don't know. It's for others to judge, really. Uh, I don't feel. You know, I'm not particularly clever or anything. It's well, just. <laughs> yeah, I just create illusions. Uh, but, um, yeah, some understanding, I think, maybe. Um, Would you have um, a message or something to share with uh, future students of Tibetan and of Tibetan studies, or current students like us? Like a, a message or an advice, a piece of advice. Right. Yeah. Understand your library. <laughs> <laughs> I think yes. Well, I feel I've felt this in Harvard too. That what are you doing when you're a student? You're working. What are you working with? Books, ideas, of course. But books, 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 books. That's your tools. And what you know, you've got to understand the library, how it works, how to find out things, and they should really do course, you know, uh, it doesn't need an awful lot to understand it or, and get the knowledge. Um, but like a half course or something, you know, right at the beginning, you know, BA, 
uh, what do they call it? undergraduate, um, freshman, you know. Uh, maybe, yeah, you probably wouldn't find it. I can remember doing my freshman and hardly going in the library at all. You know, you get, you get stuff fed to you, the, the PDFs and all that. Um, and then afterwards, going more and more. Um, but uh, I, think, I think that would be uh, helpful. I mean, it works. People, you know, develop that skill as they go along. But I just wonder if it wouldn't be more helpful to develop it earlier on in a more formal way. That's just my thinking. Um, uh, you could learn it when you learn Tibetan. You know, we learn about tea and getting a train and you know all that sort of conversation. Why not learn all the terms for Tibetan books and how they're organised and all that sort of how the literature is organised. Um, but, yeah, that's a librarian talking. Well, yeah, thank you. We are very happy to have you. Yes, well, thank you for listening. Yeah, I'm very happy that you could have been listening. Yeah. Thank you, Charles. Okay, yeah, thank thanks.